She played Elvis Presley records and taught her son to play the banjo. His mom bought his first guitar for him when he was 16, but he never had lessons. His aunt said, the guitar's all very well, John, but you'll never make a living out of it. <laughs> John's mom, Julia, was considered wild. Um, was considered wild by her family and not a proper mom. So John <coughs> said, Mimi and Uncle George took him to live with her in a more quiet environment. John's Uncle George played the harmonica and influenced John's love of words by doing crossword puzzles with him. In school, John was the class clown. He loved to joke, sometimes in mean ways. He was considered artistic and a good cartoon drawer. dad wanted him to take piano lessons, but he preferred <laughs> but he preferred to learn by listening. <coughs> then his dad gave him a nickel-plated trumpet for his birthday, which he played for a while, but eventually Paul traded it for a guitar, because he really liked rock, liked rock and roll music that he heard on the radio. He realized it would be difficult to sing while playing the trumpet. <laughs> Paul, had, <laughs> Paul had trouble learning to play the guitar because he was left-handed, but it was discovered that it was easier for him if he reversed all the strings. Paul was a good student, and his family didn't like him hanging out with John when, we, when they became friends at age 15. George was one year younger than Paul. George's, George's mom worked in a store, and his dad was a bus conductor. His mom loved to sing very loudly and listen to Radio India and its music when she was pregnant with George. George grew up loving music and listened to the radio a lot. His family wanted him to be happy and encouraged to love the music. When George was 13, his dad bought him a guitar, and a friend of his dad's taught him a few songs. After that, he practiced a lot. He was a good student, but he would sit in the back of the class drawing, drawing guitars in the school books. <laughs> Richard Starkey is better known by the name he took when he became a member of the band. We know him as Ringo because he wore lots of rings. Richard's parents loved swing dancing, singing, and dancing before he was born. But Richard's dad left his mom when he was a baby, so he wasn't influenced by him musically. Ringo became a drummer by accident. He was a sickly child and got tuberculosis when he was 13 and had to stay in a hospital for two years. The hospital encouraged the children to be in the hospital band. Richard was very bored in bed, so he started hitting cabinets next to his bed with a mallet and he, became, and he made and became the hospital drummer. After he got out of the hospital, he played music with his friends, playing a washboard with a thimble. He <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he also listened to the radio, especially liking blues and country from all of the US. <laughs> In the 1950s, in the 1950s, there was no internet and no iTunes. Can you believe that? Most new music was heard on a few channels of a radio or on records at a record store like the record you saw. John, Paul, George, and Ringo didn't have money to buy records, so they would go to the bookstore and, and there was a booth where they could listen to new records. How many of you remember that? <laughs> right. Or they would go to someone's house if they heard they got a new record, and then they might go there and listen to it 40 or 50 times, probably wearing out the grooves. America produced the most interesting and innovative popular music at that time. You will hear elements of the blues of Elvis Presley, the harmonies of the Elvis El Everly Brothers, as in the last piece, and Buddy Holly and the Crickets, and the blues style of rock and roll of Little Richard, Chuck Berry, and others. Not only did these teens listen, but they started bands that played all these artists' music. At age 13, George was in a teen band that played skiffle music. Skiffle music is a British kind of music 
that's a mixture of country, jazz, blues, and folk. John formed a band while he was in art college. Most of the teens couldn't play instruments at first, but that didn't bother them. If they heard someone in Liverpool knew how to play a different chord on their guitar, they would all get on a bus and go out and find out how to play that chord. So one song at a time, one chord at a time, they got better. The band that John started was called the Quarry Men. And he, uh, at first there were people, random people from school that were in it. And they, prayed, and they played for free pretty much anywhere they could, anywhere they were invited. <coughs> Eventually, Paul and George joined the group. George actually owned and played a guitar. So even though he was the youngest, he was only about a freshman in high school at the time, John let him join. Paul could harmonize well with John, and they shared the same taste in music. Um, Paul had written the words to his famous, when I'm 64, already in high school, but he didn't use them for about seven more years. And here's a picture of them in their band called the Quarrymen. It, this is at a wedding of George's older brother on the right. And you can see they look kind of uncomfortable in their borrowed suits. <laughs> Not only was the teen scene after World War II ready to be liberated, not only was there international broadcast radio and TV and an active rec record business, but also these good-looking, charismatic young men finally became <clears throat> excellent musicians and showmen. The fans, or teen mobs, some might say, excitement became contagious and eventually even somewhat dangerous for the group. They would grab at them and throw things at them. The group's manager got the group a booking for a few months in Hamburg, Germany, where they started experimenting with louder, more energetic styles. And this is what they looked like in Hamburg. Leather jackets and kind of strange looking hair for them. The, they were told by the German club, oh, that Paul and George and John played and pra or practiced seven hours a day, seven days a week in these clubs. So they were really, that was where they got their 10,000 hours before they <laughs> got popular. They were told by the German club owner to mach schau, mach schau. Yeah. So they started to really ham it up, dancing and screaming and throwing things around. When the Rolling Stones finally did that on stage, the Beatles just said, been there, done that. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ringo, was a professional drummer in another popular band from Liverpool and playing occasionally in Hamburg as well. So they all got to know each other there. At first, the groups played the standard rock and roll hits of the time, but eventually they went way beyond the rock and roll genre, incorporating country, ballads, classical, and later even a sitar from <coughs> India. And they started using some electronic innovative sounds. But they were, never would have gotten popular as they were, as they were without their friends and other partners. Two men were especially important. Their manager, Brian Epstein, improved their looks with new red and green suits and had them change their hairstyle. To what oh, yeah. more pe people remember them more like that. <laughs> Uh, this was a style that many teenage boys adopted in the 1960s to the chagrin of their parents. Did anybody start growing their hair long because of the Beatles? Oh, there's one out there. Oh, two guys out there. <laughs> okay. You're growing your hair long now? Is that because of the Beatles? <laughs> Brian Epstein also professionalized them with rules about being on time and no eating or drinking on stage during a performance. 
Mr. Epstein booked them for over 1,400 concerts in their first five or six years together as a group, including international performances such as the Ed Sullivan Show. Last weekend was the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival to the US and the Ed Sullivan Show appearance. Any of you were part of that 73 million people watching the Ed Sullivan Show at that time? Of course, there were only about two or three channels. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Epstein also luckily found the perfect person who would record the group and make their first little 45 record. They had only one song on each side. His name was George Martin. George Martin had a good ear, and he was actually a real musician. He was classically trained, unlike the Beatles. And he noticed the potential of the young man's original music and creative style, fortunately. George Martin also knew how to encourage their creativity, and he improved the arrangements of the songs, which is why Ringo replaced their original lackluster drummer. George Martin brought in violins and other instruments for some songs, and sometimes change the tempo or speed of the piece. In fact, Paul had to say, what's tempo? <laughs> what else worked to popularize this charismatic group of young men? Well, first of all, they were good after seven years of playing together. Young teens in England were free to go to clubs to dance and listen to music in the freer atmosphere of the times after the Second World War. The group encouraged their fan clubs and signed lots of autograph photos for their fans. They nurtured the media and were always willing to be interviewed. They made a movie early on, uh, the first music video ever. It was called A Hard Day's Night. And later they made other movies. New songs were continually added. They could write a new song in three hours. <coughs> An album was often timed to release before Christmas, so they knew the market. They could sell a lot of records. <coughs> More Beatles song made various popularity charts than any other popular musician ever. Records could not be kept in stock. Concerts eventually were no longer performances since no, most people couldn't even hear them, and they turned into wild bashes. <laughs> It was the dawning of the age of Aquarius. <coughs> Beatlemania came to the world, and the Fab Four became a legend. The group was getting weary of concerts where they were being pelted by jelly beans, because once they said they liked jelly beans. <laughs> and the American jelly beans were harder than the British jelly beans. <laughs> Their music suffered because they couldn't even hear themselves. Paul stated, we wanted to go beyond the Moon and June stuff. The group met the folk rock musician Bob Dylan, who, by the way, was very influenced by the late Pete Seeger. His music demonstrated to Paul and John that song lyrics could show intelligence, a social conscience, and introspection. It didn't have to just be Moon and June stuff. The next song used a 13-piece orchestra a harpsichord, banjo plinks, and other experimental sounds. The BBC, <coughs> they wrote it for the BBC because the BBC wanted to try out its new satellites to project a live performance around the world. The Beatles were invited to write a song and be the first to broadcast globally to 350 million people. Individuals were changing in ways that did not support the group's collaborative music making. The teens will do a short stick, skit illustrating the basic issues. Um, now, if everyone will let me write all the songs, design all the albums, manage all of our finances, and play all the instruments, I think we'll be just fine. <laughs> Yoko! 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's such a long, cold, lonely winter with our band. My guitar weeps for our fate. But please, please, just give me one more song in the new album. <laughs> if it ain't rock and roll, you don't need a drummer. 
Besides, I think I'm going into the movies. <laughs>